to get the session started, and I would like to introduce Manish Thir. Uh, Manish serves on the board of the Nudge Foundation and is also active as a mentor for budding social entrepreneurs in the Nudge Center for Social Innovation. Uh, with a career spanning nearly three decades in technology general management, he's currently based in the Bay Area, serving as the Chief Product Strategy Officer at Fair Isaac Corporation. Previously, he was based in Bangalore as the Managing Director for Apple India for six years. Uh, Manish Fanali is of Stanford University, UCLA, and IIT Delhi. Thank you for joining us, Manish. Over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you, Manish. All right, right. Well, well, hello, everybody, and uh, good afternoon and a very good evening on this August occasion to all our viewers that are dialed in. Uh, today, it is my distinct pleasure to kick off the opening plenary session of the Nudge Forum by introducing Professor Abhijit Banerjee. Professor Banerjee is the Ford Foundation International Professor of Economics at MIT and the co-winner of the Nobel Prize for Economics in 2019 for research on poverty alleviation. He is the co-founder of the Abdul Latif Jamil Poverty Action Lab, a research affiliate of Innovations for Poverty Action, a member of the Consortium on Financial Systems and Poverty, and serves on the Academic Advisory Board of Plaksha University. He's also the co-author of two very topical books, uh, Poor Economics and Good Economics for Hard Times. So uh, before I hand over to Professor Banerjee, I should mention we have about 45 minutes set aside for this session. Uh, Dr. Dr. Banerjee will be speaking for about half that time, after which we'll have a conversation with him. So welcome and over to you, Professor Banerjee. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, happy Independence Day to all the Indians who are on on this uh, on Zoom um, and listening otherwise, uh, it's. I think before one you know, gets into what's right and what's wrong with India, it's worth say saying that the Indian project is a remarkable project. It's one of the bravest adventures in state building that we know of. Um, it's uh, if you. If you read what people were saying about India in when India was proposed or um, or so sort of mooted, I, there was a uh, lots of um, lots of negativity, I would say, uh, and it's not entirely um, it's, not, it's not entirely unreasonable. And you might say that's sort of what makes the project in a sense remarkable. Uh, you know, Winston Churchill, who was really not a friend of India's, said, India is a merely a geographical expression. It is no more a single country than the equator. It's after all a nation of a, you know, hundreds of languages, 23,000 dialogues, uh, dialects, uh, many religions, so many sources of, of disagreement, conflict, and basically uh, Churchill had predicted Without the British, India will fall back quickly into the barbarism and privations of the Middle Ages. That there was uh, others who were also negative. For example, the fact that India, India was a one country which went to universal adult franchise directly from no democracy whatsoever, and in a in a at a time when India had 20% literacy and based the various lead, leading scholars of, of democracy, Robert Dow was the probably the 20th century's kind of the leader in democratic theory uh, said India is a leading contemporary exception to democratic theory. India is not supposed to be a democracy. It's not supposed to work as a democracy. If you add to that the fact there's a long history of caste-based oppression, one of the most brutal systems of discrimination known to man, you see why people 
were holding their breath when the Indian pro project was mooted. And for a long time, I felt that, you know, maybe this, this, is, this is a project that's going to collapse on its own weight. It's just too many, too many uh, divergences, too much, too much um, illiteracy, uh, too many conflicts. Uh, and, and yet, I mean, after 73 years, uh, we know that that hasn't happened. We're still a nation, fraying a bit, but, may, but still at the edges, but maybe still, still a nation, still a democracy, at least in the sense that elections are held on time, voting is mostly free, and those who get the most votes win the seat. So as the recent events highlight, there was much to be concerned about. We, we have poverty between 1993 and 2011, but maybe poverty has been going up in the last few years. Uh, that's, a, that's a concern. Caste wage gaps have shrunk very substantially since the 1980s, which reflects an equally strong convergence in the caste education gaps. If you compare that with, for example, the United States with a black-white gap has remained stubbornly large. So in, in some ways, it, uh, all of these things were our achievements. And I th the one achievement I wanted to, and I will emphasize, and that's sort of the meat of my talk, is the fact that even as a very poor country, even in 1950, we were a moral and an intellectual leader in the world. And the part that I want to spend my time talking about is our intellectual leadership. Um, I'm going to start by giving you, telling your story. In, I think, 1953, or Chuen Lai came to uh, India. Chuen Lai was the prime minister of China came to India uh, and he, his primary interest was to learn about how Indians did surveys. He went to the Indian Statistical Institute and spent hours there trying interrogating everybody about how surveys were done because he wanted to replicate that in China. That was, that's not an accident. India was in fact uh, remarkably at this point uh, when I mean by intellectual leader is literally that in this particular form of rigorous policy thinking, India was the, uh, maybe the world leader, certainly a world leader. I mean, the, both there was, this Indian Statistical Institute was a really top institution in that general area of statistics, data science, as it used to be, uh, with people like uh, C.R. Rao, uh, Raghuraj Bahadur, uh, Rajchandra Bose, Somarandanath Roy, these, these were all absolutely top people in the field. And it attracted, like for example, the great Russian mathematician Kolmogorov would come and spend months there. J.B.S. Holden, who was a, one of the great British uh, biologists and one of the founders of the field of biometrics, spent his last years working at the Indian Statistical Institute, etc. So there was, there was a really, a a sense of extraordinary quality of uh, intell intellectual quality there. The National Sample Survey, which Chu and Lai was so interested in, was the first example of a scientifically designed, nationally represented ho household survey anywhere. I mean, anywhere, not in the developing world, anywhere. And it remains the model for household surveys everywhere in the developing world. It's most surveys, the World Bank's Living Standards Me Measurement Survey is actually the NSS translated into, mildly translated into different contexts. The CSO, the Central Statistical Organization, was the pioneer in how to estimate GDP in, in a developing country. There's a thesis by Moni Mohan Mukherjee under Simon Kuznets, a Nobel Prize winner at Harvard, on how to do, how to compute uh, how GDP in a poor country. These were all really pioneering steps. We've sort of forgotten this history. I really wanted to spend a minute or two on it because it seems to me that it's a, it's a hist history that we should uh, take pride in. To continue a little bit in economics, <clears throat> the integration between high economic thinking and practical policy thinking was uh, happening as much anywhere in the world as in Delhi. 
where Jagdish Bhagavati, Amartya Sen, Tien Sinivasan, but also people who maybe we have forgotten now, but really great figures like Shukumai Chakraborty, Padma Desai, Raj Krishna, and of course Manmohan Singh were all there at the same time. They were teaching, they were re doing research, they were, they were working in policy space. A lot of the em early empirical research in development economics, my field, it came out of India, uh, Pranab Bardhan, Ashok Rudra, uh, T.N. Srinivasan were some of the great figures in, 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 this, in this enterprise. Poly, you know, Mahala Ravis and Pitambar Pant were great bureaucrats in a sense, leaders of connecting uh, policy to, uh, to, uh, 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 to sort of research, research. And it, 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 many and, and an enormous number of scholars from all over the world uh, worked on India. Um, my MIT colleague, uh, Dick Akas, uh, thinks of himself still, he's now 90, thinks of himself as an India scholar. He spent his uh, early years working in, in the planning commission. Um, so th th there's just really a remarkable level of, he, he spent himself, he spent months in Delhi, working at the Planning Commission. So this was a just a different world where we were really the intellectual hub of a particular kind of, of research. And that particular sort of elite status, I'm afraid we, we have lost. Now, it's still true that there are remarkable things that keep coming out of India. The, uh, I think the one example that I, want, I always go back to is uh, the, remarkable survey that Pratham does called ASAR, uh, the, the education survey that they do every year nationwide measuring a representative at the district level measuring education performance. That's a survey that now has been imitated in many countries, in Pakistan, in, in, in East Africa, in West Africa. It's, it's, it's something that is a tool that many countries have adopted. It was in, invented in India in the early 2000s. Um, in many ways, the, if one takes a, a slightly broader view, I think the thinking on how to design welfare schemes, um, the, the design of, 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 the, of Narega, of the Food Security Act, these were also domains where uh, research and policy making met. These are these are two of the world's largest welfare schemes. That maybe the two largest welfare schemes in the world are the Narega and the and the NFSA, the National Food Secretary Act. Um, the I think even more recently, the, the building of the Aadhaar infrastructure, the whatever its imperfections, the, con the conceptually, the idea that this, this can be a way of transforming welfare payments, the, the idea of using this, the, uh, the NDA government uh, idea of using the JAM Trinity, the uh, Jandhan, Aadhaar and uh, mobile uh, infrastructure to transform money, all of these were innovative ideas, globally innovative ideas. So, and for our own work in JPAO's work, the Abdul Latif Jamil Poverty Action Club work, India is the biggest country. We still, it's, we work with state governments, you know, all over the country, across the political spectrum. We work with, we work with Mr. Modi in Gujarat. We work with Mamata Banerjee in West Bengal. We work with Nitish Kumar in Bihar. We work with, um, Amarinder Singh in Punjab, we've worked with um, the current Haryana uh, government, we've worked with the Delhi government, we've worked with the Tamil Nadu government, we've worked with the um, UP government. So in some ways, we, it's a, there is still receptivity to research at a level and an appreciation of quality, which is extremely gratifying and helpful. But that said, I would say we are, uh, we are no longer where we were, and you can see that in, in some ways, in, in the in the reaction to um, 
you know, the way India is now reported on in the West, which is often, I would say, sometimes cruel, but often not unfair, just to point out that, for example, we, the NSS, which I was talking about with so much pride, is no longer available. The 2017-18 NSS, it had an employment round which the government disagreed with and suppressed uh, or uh, and uh, junk basically. And then the consumption data, which showed that maybe poverty was actually rising slightly, was also is no longer available to us. Um, the GDP data, again, uh, there seems to be constant revisions in how it's done and to the point where the chief, previous chief economic advisor, Arvind Subramaniam, has said that the growth rate is probably half of what is being claimed. Um, all kinds of, uh, you know, they, they were supposed to be an NSS uh, data that was going to help us revise the GDP. Instead, that data was, the government rejected that data. So we're in a place where very little information about India, hard information is coming out. And that's, a, that's, a, that's frightening. Um, some of this is, I think, genuine problems in the NSO so and CSO, which we should have fixed many years ago, has been pointed out by many people for many years and has not been fixed. And I think that is a that that's in some ways the pressure is not a bad thing, but I think there is also just I think lack of prioritization, which has allowed the the National Statistical Commission, which was set up I think 15 years ago, has still the bill for it has not passed Parliament yet because essentially it's not a priority for anybody, and so uh, the kind of thing that can give priority to high quality data is just not happening. And I think in general, su successive governments, not just this one, have been suspicious of, 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 of uh, losing control over the data. Um, I think the consequences of a lack of, of a culture of scientifically informed policymaking were all too evident in the recent pandemic. Um, the, the lockdown, in my opinion, and I think of opinion was too early. We did it too quickly uh, before enough. If we knew that the lockdown would only last for a short amount of time, we, we would, might have wanted to have a um, uh, 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 so lockdown, which was at the, when the disease was really, uh, had already reached a lot of people to lock down then, because then, you would slow it down when it's actually needed to slow down. Uh, we, we did instead, we moved very early and then opened up very early because you can't keep people locked down for a very long time. And that created, um, that created uh, I think, worse outcomes than would have been otherwise. Uh, we had not thought about the migrants, the way the lockdown was done, the fact that it was just shut down uh, you know, the country was shut down in four hours notice. Just partly just the thought of what the migrants will do was had not been engaged with. And that's partly because we know so little about migrants. We, in fact, we have no survey that actually know, in, now that migration is a matter of, you know, 10 or 20 or 30 million or even more people, we just don't have any sense of how they live, how many of them are there. Uh, where they live, a lot of them, the problem was partly that they, the migrants had just no place to live. They lived, they always lived in the construction site. And when the construction site was closed, they just had no place to live. And that kind of thing needs to be documented. We need, it, need an intellectual basis for dealing with these problems. If you don't have an intellectual basis, we're going to keep making these mistakes. Uh, by the time, the migrants problem was fully recognized. The migrants had lived in, the, in those cities for a long enough time in Bombay, in Delhi, where they were getting COVID. And that meant that when they went back and they went back in crowded trains and crowded uh, trucks, uh, they were spreading the disease to more people. Um, the, the, the fact that we are, we keep till the end of July, there was just the, uh, the head of ICMR was declaring that there's no community transmission in India. Some states were not. They were 
you know, Kerala and West Bengal had already admitted there was community transmission, but the fact that there was just, again, that's just unscientific. There's no possible way that could be true. So I, I feel that that's a, that's a sign of a country which is no longer as clear about its commitment to a, a you know, knowledge-based, science-based uh, policy thinking as it was, as we started. I think in some ways, we, may, we made many mistakes. I and mean, this is not to say that science always gets it wrong. I mean, clearly our planned economy was a disaster. But I think that we, 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 we certainly, we, the way we discovered it was a disaster was partly the work of people who were doing scientific work, like Bhagavati, like Srinivasan, like Padma Desai. And I, I think the fact that we, like Raj Krishnan, there were many, many of these people were criticizing from the beginning or from very early years, the way we were doing planning. So I think this, 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 the fact there was intellectual culture of engagement with the policy space where everybody appreciated quality thinking and precise precision and being right was, was, was very instrumental in the way India had evolved. And now I think that's such a... So to end, I want to say um, the new economic education policy has just been announced and its goal is to turn India into a vibrant knowledge hub, I quote. And I think the, and there are good ideas in the, in the policy, certainly uh, due to trying to attract world-class universities and to adopt their models of education. Both of those are good ideas. But I think more importantly, we have to have faith in knowledge, wherever it takes us. And that's not to say that the exa exact truth is always available to us, it's often elusive, but that's not a reason to stop paying attention to the available evidence. We have to have faith in those who produce knowledge. We can't just constantly question their motives. We can't say that if you are producing a piece of uh, information that's sort of counter to what, what, what we believe, then you must have the wrong motives. We have to trust them. We need leadership at all levels to be about asking questions, asking the right questions. I think Nehru was famously someone who would ask difficult questions to his people, and then they would have to, they would hunt around and find answers. And I think it's very important that it the that it be about asking questions and not about pronouncing the truth. And we need a culture where being wrong is accepted but being bl willfully blind is not. I think that's, I think we have to allow people, I think part of engaging with knowledge is accepting the possibility of being wrong, but not the possibility of, of just looking the other way. And I think we, we need to, if we want to get there, if we want to make in, India, uh, go back to being an intellectual leader, we need to engage with these ideas. And I hope, and, and on this day, I, I wish for India that it regains its status as an intellectual leader in the world. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Banerjee, for your insightful remarks. Uh, in the time that we have now remaining, uh, if you don't mind, we'll switch over to a little bit of a Q&A and have a conversation. Uh, using some of the questions that have come in from our audience. Now for the audience, I see a lot of you popping questions in. I'd like to mention that we've had actually questions come in, not just today, but the last few days. So we've organized them into a few common themes and we'll use those to have a conversation with Professor Banerjee. So kicking things off, Professor Banerjee, and since you've talked about COVID a little bit, uh, and it, uh, you know, the, the desirability of, of fact and science basis uh, in decision making. You know, the intervention to uh, the, the crisis has varied a lot across countries. Uh, are there any specific examples you would like to call out as being worthy of emulation, things that maybe we should have as part of a longer term conversation? So I'll give you an example of a country which I don't know exactly how, a country that nobody ever would mention 
I think normally as a leader, uh, it's a country of Togo. Togo did three things that seem right. One is it didn't, when so many other countries were going on to, into lockdown, it didn't go into lockdown, it waited. It eventually, the capital, there was a lockdown in the capital, but it waited a long time. Second, it, it uh, announced that everybody will get a cash transfer. And so third, it used a, a phone-based infrastructure that it had already set up, which we haven't yet managed to get to, to, to send the cash transfer. And as a result, it, there was no panic. It was, they managed to control the process much better. And uh, it's, some, it's a, a sort of unsung story because it's, it's, a, it's a very small African country with, you know, I guess no particular, uh, I, I mean, I don't think people expected it would be an outlier, but it, it was. And sometimes I'm, I'm always impressed by those kinds of examples. So that's, a, that's an example of a country which basically in my view got it much more right than most countries. That is truly an un unusual example and a good one. Any, any other example of, a, of an economy or a society that, uh, that you would like to mention? I think many countries did, uh, I think, I mean, I, I think for example, in many ways, what they did eventually in Dharavi was pretty impressive. They did uh, get, identify everybody who was infected and take them out. They took them out of Dharavi. The reason why Dharavi managed to control its um, uh, infection rates was because they managed to take people out and put them into, into uh, hospitals or in community care or somewhere so that they, they, they didn't spread the disease. In that, uh, that kind of crowded environment, it was a, would have been very difficult to manage otherwise. And I think they did an impressive job, actually. Okay. Thank you. I'm taking maybe a step back, right? And then looking at this more structurally, um, I remember a talk you gave recently, I think it was at the LSE, where you talk uh, about the fact that the crisis has exposed the fragility of our systems, both economic and social. So as an economist, do you think that that data is self-evident or we also need to look at the world differently? We need to augment our lens to better capture, highlight this fragility, this structural weakness as a way of helping address it. Well, I, I already sort of, was getting into that, which is that I think one place, for example, our data system has no record of migrants. The way we collect data, both the NSS and the census, essentially ask people, if you, if you happen to live on, on a construction site, you don't exist. You are only counted as a citizen by reference to your parents might mention you as someone who lived, who is away, but is from this household. And that's how you get counted. And if in the NSS, what it does is ask people, um, how many people ate uh, food with you in the last month or something. And there you just don't get counted. So it's, 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 it's very much a, a way of, uh, our entire data system is, assumes that people live at home. Our, Welfare system assumes people live at home. You cannot get PDS. Uh, the government is now talking about a portable PDS and that's a great idea. But it, I don't know why, but it's a, it's a fact that we never engage with just how many people are migrants that made it possible to, to not have, a, 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 to have a domicile-based system. Domicile-based system makes no sense in an economy where you know, tens of, you know, maybe even 50 million people are, are migrants at any point of time. It just makes no sense. We just don't know how many migrants there are. And we, then because we don't know that, we don't make policy that accommodates them. Mm -hmm. Fair point. Um, 
maybe now switching out of uh, the here and now and, and looking at the world a little bit more long term and, and you know going back to the research I think that uh, uh, you were famous for a lot of your studies highlight the fact that uh, small nudges as you call them and this word is particularly um, one we can relate to that small nudges can have a disproportionate impact and sometimes far more than a conventional or potentially more research intensive program right and I think you give the example of how a kg of dal can impact favorably immunization rates right and so as economists or policy makers or NGOs how should we orient ourselves to thinking and innovating around what I would say you know are small meaningful interventions sort of identifying that nudge as our primary response or our first response as we think about it. So I'll give you an example. Uh, we did a, just did a, a, a randomized control trial in West Bengal, where before we did that, we uh, asked, we did a survey and in the survey we asked people and um, what the respondents uh, on the phone, this phone survey, um, you know, what they, are they supposed to do? And most people knew the answers. It was not that they didn't know that they're supposed to make wear masks, they're not supposed to uh, go out, they're supposed to wash hands, et cetera, et cetera. The, most of them knew, like a very, very large majority knew the answer. Then you could ask, a different set of people, did you actually do that? And of course, most people were not doing any of those things, okay? So there were, not, you know, mass people were kind of wearing, but not washing hands, you know, maybe uh, sometimes and, you know, or not going out. Yeah, none of them were. So, you know, it's easy to send messages to people and assume that they will stick. Now. I was persuaded by friends to actually make a video where I sent a message to I, as somebody who happens to be now quite well known in West Bengal, I sent a video message to um, 20, so 25 million people. Um, control group of 3 million people. And then we can measure again and that has large impact on whether they go out of the village, et cetera, et cetera, or they, you know, how many times they wash their hands. Et so even you, I think it's one of the one obvious thing is let's not assume anything is obvious. Things are obvious, people know it, but they know it in half their brain and then they hold it there. They don't actually engage with it. And if you keep kind of the right way of nudging them, then they might actually implement. That's, a, that's, a, that's an example a very recent example on, on COVID. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, well, the questions are flooding in. So if you don't mind, I'm going to pop a few more to you. Uh, here's one. Um, has the nature of poverty changed in your opinion since independence? Absolutely. I mean, it is clear that right now, almost, you know, the people who were really poor at independence mostly don't exist anymore. The people, the, pe the children who were, who had no clothes, who would walk around my neighborhood in Kolkata. And I grew up in a very, uh, I, we were perfectly middle class, but we li lived in a very uh, low income neighborhood. And the kids walk, who were, most kids in our areas walked around till the age of six with no clothes on, with their belly sticking out, their red hair, your typical sign of, malnutrition, that you don't see. Malnutrition is one of the things which has actually been improving. Uh, in the last 10 years, we have seen a, quite a substantial dent in mal malnutrition, remarkably enough. Uh, so it's a, a you know 23% reduction, I think, in, in stunting, and quite, quite big numbers. So it's, it's one of these things that uh, I feel is, uh, has changed. It, the, the poorest of the poor don't exist anymore, in a sense, thankfully. What they, the, the, there are still people who should not have to live the way they live. Certainly living in Dharavi is extraordinary. In the, in the, a number that really, 
I find hard to believe, but it's claimed is a life expectancy of a Dharavi resident is still 43 years. A male Dharavi resident is still 43 years. That's a number that is extraordinarily uh, awful and we should not tolerate it. It, should, it shouldn't be true. In any, mm -hmm. any reasonable world, it should not be true. But it's been given that in, in the rest of India, 67 years. Uh, it's a, but it's, 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 it's where we are. And so I, I think that things have gotten better, but of course that hasn't solved many problems. Yeah. If I may now move to uh, the migrant population, because that's been one of the yeah. things you spoke of. One of the uh, questions that has come in is, you know, to what extent should the government engage with civil society? For example, how can government and civil society think about and understand uh, the migrant population? Well, I, th I think that there, I think we should start by doing a systematic survey of, mm -hmm. of uh, where we track people from when somebody says, my son is in, somebody in Odisha says, my son is in Chennai. It's typically possible, we've done this actually, we can get the phone number, we can track him down and we need a nationwide tracking system where you know where he's coming from, where he is, track him down. Uh, the, it's very hard to find these people otherwise because they live in unorthodox places like sleep under a, under a truck or something sometimes um, because uh, so you, 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 you have to find a way of calling them and then finding them and going and talking to them. But I think this survey uh, at the national scale, we need a kind of a, a mag order of magnitude sense of how many people there are, how do they live, et cetera. It's just, I think without that, we can't really engage. We can just make up stories. Uh, we really need to have some idea of just how do these people, uh, uh, you know, where do they spend, spend the night? Well, you know, how, how much, how do they send money home, et cetera, et cetera. There's just a bunch of stuff that we don't know. Thank you. Um... This one um, is more, if I can call it from one of our younger viewers, because a lot of the folks who are dialed in, I think, are uh, in their 20s. And then this person asks, how do we motivate the youth in India who are seeking better opportunities? You know, I feel that, uh, in a sense, my worry with is, um, I'll tell you something that's a fact that worries me. Um, if you look at the, the NSS data, when NSS data was available last, till the last round, when this was true in the 80s, it was true in the 90s, it was true in the same fact is true. Which is that if you look at the median, not median, the 25 year old Indian, lots of them are not in the labor force yet. Lots of them are saying they're taking courses, they're doing something. Now by the age of, 30 that vanishes they all all are they all all male indians are employed at 30 and really two percent is the unemployment rate but at 25 that number is very different mm -hmm. and, that, the, and that given that our population has a youth bulge that has large consequences for you know gdp for example because a bunch of people are not working and why are they not working partly i think it's the fact that they have two conservative aspirations. They want government jobs. We've sort of seen other evidence, I don't have the time to go into it, suggesting that, you know, people are obsessed with government jobs. They, they sacrifice, I think, many years of their life in the pursuit of government jobs, and then don't get them because there are few government jobs, in fact, and then eventually get something and do it. But is, I think in some ways, this, this obsession with government jobs, the security of the whatever the fact that you cannot be fired, et cetera, et cetera. This, this is, this is, in a sense, is holding back our youth. I think we need to be more adventurous, you know, think, uh, you know, of, I think the private sector 
and you know starting your own business all of those are different options but we if we stay obsessed with the government jobs then we're going to handicap ourselves mm -hmm. okay yeah. i now get to what i'm thinking is possibly the last question we get to ask you how do we improve implementation of policies be they related to livelihood food security education or health uh, how do we improve the implementation at the grassroots level you know i think some of the policy it's 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 worth being clear that you know many of the policies have improved they improved yeah. you know um, narega when it started the the leakage rates were 50%. You ask somebody, you know, if you max the uh, numbers on how much money was sent versus how much people report in household surveys, the number was 50%. The number quickly went up to 80%. So it, likewise, uh, PDS clearly has improved over the last 10 years. So, or, you know, since the NFSA was passed, I think it's improved. So it's not, one should not start with the presumption that it's all bad, because then, then it's paralyzing. I think we should start with the idea that improvements are possible. They happen, very large scale improvements are possible. Yeah. That's sort of what I think this is saying. These are the two biggest programs and both of them have improved enormously. So I think lots of, lots of money has got to people where, where it wasn't getting to people. And so I think that's, so I think first point, let's be positive, let's, yeah. it can be done. Second is I think it would be useful to not have so many schemes. I think we have too many schemes, very hard to have either civil society's attention on 370 schemes or the government's attention on 370. Just, is, I think basically very few schemes really ma matter, but a lot of the other ones are sources of leakage. So, you know, in terms of, Actual welfare, the Indira Awas Yojana is another one that matters. And I think eventually the, you know, the, the, the cash transfers to the farmers, that's another one that matters, but is the new, new, uh, the, the new cash transfer to farmers. But it's not that many other schemes that really do anything. It's just, they're like a, a bit like, you know, some, an afterthought and that afterthought then drags on and wastes resources. So I think if we had fewer schemes and focused on a few schemes, but doing them better and better, I think we could get there. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, I have to tell you that the questions are pouring in. There's still about 60 that I haven't gotten to, but uh, we're almost out of time. And I know it's pretty late in the day where you are. So, uh, I'd say let's conclude our session. And I'd like to thank you for taking the time. I know you're a busy man uh, for taking the time to do this and be a part of our event. We greatly appreciate it having you here and learning from your work. So thank you once again. Thank you. Thank you for having me.